Okay, so let's talk now about inverse functions and the IFT. And one thing I will say, I'm going to tell you how to differentiate inverse functions. Some books instead do this with uh, implicit differentiation. And that's a perfectly reasonable way to do that. We will be covering implicit differentiation in a little bit, and I will even then talk about how to approach this problem in that way as well. I'm going to teach this too, so you'll have both. So let's remind ourselves how inverse functions work. Well, if we have, let's say, a function like this, so I need a couple of colors here. Let's say we have a function for positive numbers, y is equal to x squared. Well, what's an inverse function? It's a function that if we apply the inverse function to this function, we get back to where we started, back to x. And in this case, it's pretty easy to see what's the inverse of squaring, of squaring a positive number. Well, it's taking its positive square root. Okay, so this is a nice picture of a particular pair of functions that are inverse to one another. <coughs> and indeed, let's just remind ourselves how do inverse functions work? Well, the graph of an inverse function arises by taking the graph of the original function and flipping it along the line y is equal to x. Why is this happening? Well, because what's the relationship between a function and its inverse? You're switching the roles of y and x, and flipping along the line y is equal to x also switches the roles of y and x. So this is how this works. But what one could ask is one could ask about differentiating an inverse function. So what would be happening here? Well, let's say we want to differentiate uh, the inverse function at, say, this point here. So why this point here? Well, let's just say we have a point on the original graph. Let's call it x comma y. So the corresponding point on the inverse graph is going to be this point here, y comma x. So let's talk about how to differentiate the inverse function at this point here. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if we took the tangent line to this function, y is equal to x squared, and we wanted to compare it to the tangent line at this point of y is equal to root x, well, the graphs have been flipped along the line y is equal to x, so basically their tangent lines are also being flipped along the line y is equal to x. So what's that going, how's that going to work? Well, let's just ask ourselves that. If I take the line y is equal to mx plus b, and I flip this along the line y is equal to x, that's going to flip around x and y. It's going to give me this new line, x is equal to my plus b. But now how can I write this line in terms of y equals? Well, I can bring the b over to the other side, and I can get that this turns into my is equal to x minus b. So then I can divide out by m and get that y is equal to 1 over mx minus b over m. Let's not worry about this minus b over m. It's still here. It's what's correct. But the point is, is that if you take a line of slope m and flip it along the line y is equal to x, you get a new line of slope 1 over m. So what's that saying? That's saying that the derivative of the inverse function at this point should be 1 over the derivative of the original function at this point. So let me write this uh, notationally. So what this means, and this is called the IFT, 
the inverse function theorem. And this says, if f at x is such that f prime at a is not zero, then, well, notationally, you've probably seen this before, we denote the inverse function of f as f inverse. So let me just add in if f is invertible, because of course some functions aren't invertible, but imagine you have a function that you know has an inverse function. You could talk about this in some detail. You can ask when a function is or isn't invertible. This has a little bit to do with the sign of the derivative. Sometimes you can do it directly. But let's just brush all that under the rug and presuppose that we're talking about a function that does have an inverse. That is to say, this function has to pass the horizontal line test. So, if you have a function that's invertible and such that f prime at a is not zero, then we can differentiate the inverse function at f at a. So in this graph here, you could write x, y as x, f at x, and you could write y, x as f at x, y, just letting x squared be our f at x here, just in the tad to the picture. So the derivative of the inverse function, that is to say the derivative of the square root function, at this point f at a is going to be 1 over f prime at a. And this is exactly what we just figured out before. If the slope of the tangent line here is m, the slope of the tangent line to this graph to this point has to be 1 over m. And though this looks a little fussy and a little technical, that's really all this is saying. Okay, so let's do some examples with this. Okay, so let's do some examples with this, and I'm gonna do two types of examples. One of the examples I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you the derivative of another very important function that is gonna come up in a lot of cases, a lot of contexts and calculus classes anyway, so you need to know how to differentiate it. And then I'm gonna give you sort of a more theoretical example, because you can use this theorem this idea that I talked about uh, previous, just a moment ago to sort of talk about things more theoretically even if you don't have a picture or a graph in front of you. But the first example is, remember that we have that the inverse function to e to the x is ln of x or the natural logarithm of x. So let's try to compute the derivative of the natural logarithm. So, okay, what we have to do <coughs> is, so let's pick a, and let's let a, uh, uh, let's let a be some number greater than zero, because we know that the logarithm from the graph only makes sense on numbers greater than zero. So one thing that we can say is, in fact, any positive number, you can write as e to the something. So let's write that a is equal to e to the b. Okay, so let's now differentiate the logarithm function at a. So how do we do this? So let's say we want to take ln prime at a. Well, what is this? So you might ask yourself, can we use the idea that I just mentioned on this guy here, ln being an inverse function of e to the x at a, no we can't. But what we can do is we can apply it to e to the b, because our formula let us compute the, in, the derivative of the inverse function of f at f at x, so let's just, what we're doing in the background is we're letting f at x be equal to e to the x, and x is equal to b. So we can apply the IFT, the inverse function theorem, to this case here, to get that the derivative of this is 1 over the derivative of f at x at b. But of course, as we saw in the last video, the derivative of e to the x is itself, so this is just 1 over e to the b.
Okay? But now, what can we do with this? Well, we also know that e to the b is equal to a. So we can write this as 1 over a. Aha! Well, what does this tell us? It tells us that the derivative of the logarithm function is the function 1 over x. And I will also, just for completeness sake, I'll do this example specifically when we get to implicit differentiation, just so you can see the two different ways that it's done. But indeed, this is just, you have to do this tricky thing where you have to remember that all numbers greater than zero are e to the something. But with that in mind, the IFT pretty easily allows you to compute this derivative. So that's one good example, and indeed, now we can add the logarithm into our menagerie of functions that we know how to differentiate. Okay, now let's talk about a whole other different type of problem, and this is something that could absolutely be given to you on some sort of a homework set, some sort of a test, just sort of a question about definitions. So it's something like the following. So let's suppose that f of 1 is equal to 3 and f prime of 1 is equal to 3 over 7. So uh, if g of x is equal to f inverse of x, what is g prime of 3? So this is a, a common way to word a problem. So how can you solve this? So indeed, uh, <laughs> I've sort of buried something in here. If you write that g of x is equal to f inverse of x, and some books will write this out in detail, some books will just sort of brush this under the rug, but of course, if we're even writing this statement, we're presupposing that the function f has to be invertible. So of course, this function f on some interval we're working on, necessarily some interval containing 1, has to satisfy the horizontal line test. So let's just suppose it does and move on from there. But indeed, do remember, not every function is invertible. By writing this, we're presupposing that this can be done. So keep that in the back of your mind. So the answer to this question here is it looks a little funny because we don't have a graph to work with. We don't have a lot of information. But we can use the IFT fairly directly here g prime at 3, well, g is f inverse, so we're looking at f inverse prime, and what is 3? Three? 3 is f of 1. Aha! We've been able to rewrite this strange looking problem into one that we can actually directly apply the IFT to. The IFT is tailor-made for this specific situation, this tells us that the derivative here is 1 over f prime of 1, which is 1 over 3 over 7, which is 7 over 3. And that's how a problem like this shakes out.